Hello everyone and welcome back to this non Photonics and Plasmonix course. Uh, in this video we're going to discuss and compare uh, Photonic and Plasmonic waveguides. Uh, but first of all, let's try to define what an optical waveguide is. Uh, and an optical waveguide is simply a physical structure, whatever structure it is. The purpose is to guide and transmit electromagnetic waves. And it typically operates in the optical portion of the, the electromagnetic spectrum, so typically in the visible and near infrared. The simplest and most uh, common waveguide is just the optical fiber. Um, so those are really basic elements uh, that serve as building block in many optical systems. Uh, and you have some examples here and they're basically just serving uh, the, the same purpose as electric wires uh, for electric circuits and uh, electronic components. So um, those waveguides can be typically classified uh, based on uh, four different type of characteristics. Uh, the first one is just the geometry, optical lenses and mirrors, uh, stripes and, and slabs which are basically just uh, two different type of materials. One material is basically serving as a, the, the, the medium to sustain the electromagnetic radiation. The other one is more uh, to, to confine the electromagnetic radiation. Uh, you have also, uh, of course, the standard optical fibers, which is just uh, glass, uh, glass uh, cylindrical fibers. Uh, or even microstructured uh, fibers, as we already introduced in chapter 6. Uh, photonic crystals uh, and defect lines in photonic crystals, as uh, we discussed also in chapter 6, uh, serve also the purpose of waveguides. Uh, the second uh, characteristic is the type of mechanism that gonna allow you to guide the electromagnetic signal uh, through the, the waveguide. So it could be in total internal reflection where the light uh, is basically just bouncing back and forth um, at the interface between two uh, different media. Uh, it could be uh, the use of photonic band gap if you're dealing with photonic crystals. It could be the use of total uh, external reflection uh, if you're actually uh, looking at the case of metamaterials. The third uh, characteristic is the mode structure of the, the optical waveguide. It could be single mode or multi-mode. Uh, we're going to discuss briefly about that in the next slide. And finally, the fourth one is the type of material that you actually use. The uh, simplest uh, example of photonic waveguide is the optical fiber, uh, which was uh, pioneered by uh, Charles Call uh, in the 1960s. Uh, he received the Nobel Prize in 2009 for this uh, pioneering work. And it's basically just uh, a simple dielectric cylindrical uh, waveguide, uh, which is just constituted by a, a glass core typically or in general uh, by a high uh, refractive index material. Uh, it's surrounded by uh, a cladding, uh, which is composed of a lower refractive index. Uh, the difference in refractive index between the core and the cladding is responsible for this total internal reflection that will basically confine the light within the glass core. And then you have additional uh, layers on top of that. So you have a coating, and you have some uh, strengthening material that basically just uh, uh, provide mechanical uh, strength to the to the optical fiber uh, overall and then you have some other jacket to protect the overall from uh, the environment. So if you look at the size of those uh, those components, so the, the core uh, is typically of the order of 10 to 50 microns in diameter. Uh, then the coding is typically uh, between 150 to 250 microns. Uh, and the overall uh, fiber, including the outer jacket, uh, is basically typically of the order of millimeter in size. So you see that you're looking at something very bulky. Um, I discussed uh, just before about the fact that uh, we can have single mode or multi mode. Uh, this is basically uh, governed by this simple expression in the case of an optical fiber. So this parameter V uh, is dependent on the on the diameter of the uh, the glass core. Lambda is the, the wavelength uh, of the mode you're trying to, to propagate. And it's going to depend on the contrast of refractive index between the, the core and the cladding. So if this parameter V is below 2.405, uh, then it sustains single mode. Uh, so if you want a multi-mode propagation for your fiber, uh, you're going to have to increase this V. Uh, therefore, you're going to have to either increase the size of your dielectric core or decrease the wavelength of operation. So sending a lower wavelength uh, closer to the to the UV, uh, and you can also play, of course, with the the contrast and refractive index between the core and uh, the cladding. 
there are several uh, major physical phenomena uh, that are going to impact the, the, the light propagation uh, in this particular optical fiber or in general uh, any type of optical uh, waveguides. Uh, so these are the, the dispersion, uh, nonlinear uh, effects, uh, losses and gain and noise. Typically the dispersion is when you have a, a temporal signal, so you have a short pulse of uh, electromagnetic radiation, so you have a short pulse of light, uh, which is uh, with a given uh, temporal duration as it propagates through, uh, through the, 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 the material because the material is uh, always dispersive. Uh, then the, the signal you're going to collect is going to be basically broad and temporary, so it's going to be extended. So if you send the success, successive pulses, then basically you take the, the risk that those pulses, if they are too close temporarily, that they're basically going to overlap temporarily uh, and arrive simultaneously uh, at the end of your, your, uh, your waveguide. Nonlinear uh, interaction is basically just due to the nonlinear effect of the, of the materials. So if you send some, um, some uh, optical signal with different uh, wavelengths, uh, then basically because of non-inter interactions, you're going to generate harmonics um, that are basically non-desired. So you're going to generate a uh, more complex signal that is also uh, difficult to process. Then, of course, losses is just the loss of signal uh, when uh, the, the signal propagates through the, the waveguide. So if you have a given intensity at the beginning, you're basically uh, losing a lot of intensity. Uh, as you as you move a, uh, along the waveguide, and this is dependent on the material, on the geometry, on the length of propagation. Uh, gain in noise, uh, this is also something that can happen. Uh, basically, if you have a, a signal at the, as an input, what, what can happen is that when you propagate the signal through the, the, the waveguide, uh, you're going to have some artificial gain uh, coming from uh, various mechanisms like uh, reflection, resonance, like fabriper resonances and stuff. Um, and you're going to introduce some, some noise as well. Uh, so you're going to amplify uh, and introduce artificial noise due to the, the propagation. So if you're interested in uh, uh, fiber optics or nonlinear optics in general, so these are uh, two great resources. So these are two books that uh, I recommend reading if you're interested in uh, looking into that, especially the second one, nonlinear optics. Uh, that's something which is, uh, which is very useful if you're, if you're uh, planning on studying optics and nonlinear optics in general. Let's uh, look at some examples. Um, so in the case of uh, structured optical fibers, we discussed about that a little bit in chapter six. Uh, so in the case of photonic crystals, and we've seen that defect lines uh, in photonic crystals, uh, whether if it's just a straight line or more complex uh, defect lines, uh, can serve as uh, low loss waveguides. So uh, their benefit is uh, basically just uh, threefold. So as I said, uh, we can just shape them the way we want. We can have really um, large uh, angle bands uh, uh, without basically loss. So we can have ideally low loss uh, propagation. This is what this diagram shows here that uh, the optical signal you send at the, at the input has the same intensity as the, the optical signal uh, in both outputs. Uh, we can also spectrally engineer them uh, by changing the, the periodicity, the composition, the size of the, the building blocks. Uh, and this is basically done through the, the band structure calculation or, or engineering. And you basically try to open this band gap, this photonic band gap. And you can change uh, the, the band gap. So you can open it and close it. You can change the frequency or energy of the operation uh, of the, the photonic crystal by just uh, shifting this, this band gap and up and down in, uh, in frequency. So these are uh, things that we've already looked into a little bit in chapter six. So now what about, uh, what about plasmons? Uh, well, basically uh, plasmons and especially uh, SPPs uh, are basically the underlying mechanisms for plasmonic waveguides. For instance, if you take the, the metal insulator interface, so you have uh, one slab of uh, semi semi-infinite layer of metal and semi-infinite layer of, uh, of dielectric. You're going to sustain SPPs at the, at the metal dielectric interface. And this is basically just the simplest uh, plasmonic waveguides you can think of. We covered that extensively uh, throughout chapter eight. So now you can actually modify this a little bit uh, and uh, basically just a second layer of dielectric at the bottom. So now you have an insulator, metal insulator waveguide. So of course the, the, the metal waveguide uh, has to be a thin metallic layer uh, and basically this offers a uh, very long propagation length uh, 
via the, the coupling of two SPPs. So you have a SPP at the upper surface, you have a SPP at the lower surface, uh, and those two SPPs, if the metallic film is, uh, is fairly thin, uh, then you can have basically uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric coupling of those, those, two, um, those two SPP modes. And that's basically going to propagate along this, uh, this waveguide. So now you can have also the, the complementary geometry. Uh, so it's basically you have metal, and that is with metal interface. Uh, and this new geometry allows uh, for, for different things. So first, because of the presence of metal on both sides, uh, because of the, the very low skin depth in the metal, so you can have a very strong electromagnetic confinement of the, uh, the modes within the dielectric. So if you use a very thin dielectric, then you're gonna have a very small transverse dimension and therefore high confinement. So these are uh, very, uh, very interesting when you have those thin dielectric slabs. So uh, let's look at the, uh, a given example and see what we are talking about in terms of numbers. Uh, so you can actually look at uh, a glass, uh, gold, uh, super straight type of configuration. So this is a three layer system where you have a substrate, which is composed of glass, you have a thin, 50 nanometer gold uh, film, and then you have a super straight, uh, which is just an over, an over layer composed of a dielectric permittivity epsilon three, and in that particular uh, calculations, they basically change the value of epsilon three. So they went from epsilon three equal one, which is just a uh, vacuum or air, and these are the, the open circles here. So this is the, the dispersion relation of the SPP. So this is the propagation constant or the, the K vector of the SPP that you generate at the surface of, uh, of the gold film uh, as a function of here the, the incident uh, care vector. So this is the, the wave number uh, of the optical excitation you send. Uh, in other words, this is the inverse uh, of the, the incident wavelength. So when you, you're looking at here uh, short wavelengths and long wavelength for the optical excitation, you, uh, you, you can see how far the, the plasma will propagate before dying. So uh, when you're looking at uh, basically a glass, gold, air interface, uh, so these are the open circles, uh, you see that uh, if you're looking at um, an inverse wavelength uh, of uh, 10 uh, inverse micrometers, uh, then basically you can have a, a propagation of about 10 inverse microns, that's gonna be the, the K vector for the, the plasma. Now, as you increase the dielectric permittivity to that of, uh, of glass, epsilon three uh, equal 2.25, looking at those, uh, those triangles, and that's basically what you have here. So you see that when you increase the refractive index of the superstrate, the propagation of the plasma will actually increase significantly to about uh, 17 inverse microns. So you have a 70% increase uh, when you change from air to, to glass uh, for the superstrate. Um, so the open circles uh, are basically the symmetric modes uh, when basically the, the two modes gonna be uh, symmetric and in phase and the, the, the field symbols here are basically the anti-symmetric uh, where basically they're gonna be out of phase. Uh, so we're gonna discuss about symmetric and anti-symmetric in, uh, in a little bit but basically you can already see that anti-symmetric modes propagate much longer than their symmetric uh, counterpart. Although um, all those plasmonic waveguides are really based on a very similar uh, mechanism, which is just uh, based on SPPs, uh, they are really performing differently uh, and they have different characteristics, with, whether it's for propagation, uh, confinement, and in particular, uh, you're gonna have also to deal with a trade-off between those two propagation and confinement characteristics. Uh, so in the end, it's very uh, very useful to introduce a, a figure of merit uh, to really characterize the performance uh, of a, a given plasmonic waveguides. So this figure of merit uh, is gonna be given by this simple expression. Uh, so it's basically LP, where LP is just the, the, the propagation length, so how far the, the, the waveguide will propagate the electromagnetic signal and this is inversely proportional to the imaginary part of uh, the, the K vector, uh, where in that particular case, KZ is the direction where the electromagnetic wave will propagate. And then, of course, you have this uh, denominator A2, which is just the mode area 
Uh, so you can calculate this by taking the special integral of the uh, density of electromagnetic energy. So I'll refer you to chapter two for this uh, density of electromagnetic energy. So basically you calculate how much electromagnetic energy you have uh, and you can basically look at where this electromagnetic energy is actually localized in space and that gives you this mod array or mod volume if you're looking at a three-dimensional um, So these uh, two physical quantities uh, basically govern the propagation of the mode uh, and confinement of the mode. So if you want to, uh, to optimize your optical fiber or your optical waveguide or plasmonic waveguide, uh, what you need to do is increase this figure of merit by either increasing the propagation length and or decreasing the, the, the mod area or the mod volume.